Chapter 31. Chapter 31. If you want to read ahead, go and check slash www.patreon.com slash cornbringer. I'm currently updating twice a day on Patreons. Love you guys. So far, my training with Piandao has been fun. Even the gardening part that I was pretty sure he put me to that, that just because he doesn't hire any landscapers. Calligraphy was a breeze. The one I was having troubles with was with the way of the sword. You are not used to weapons, are you? Master Piando asked with an amused tone, stopping our daily spar. Tam not, I chuckled. You are treating our spar as if it was a bending fight, Master Piando said with a frown. And I couldn't do anything but stared at him in mild shock. Your stances are all bare-handed water-bending stances, the old man smirked at me, as he went on about my flaws in hand-to-hand -hand weapon combat. A bit risky against armed opponents when you are not using bending, you would do well learning a few sword stances. Since when? I asked after a second. Since the day I met you, Piandao replied, showing little to no emotion. I don't care where you come from, that doesn't matter to the way of the sword. If I had had any doubts about him or his motives, I was now completely sold. This man was awesome on my list. So I have to forget about my stances, I muttered. No, Pian Dao shook his head. You need to insert them like a good condiment. Alone is nothing, but with a good base, can be glorious. A food metaphor, neat. So I have to complement my base with what I know, not the other way around. Meaning, I would have to form a really good base with my sword, and then I would improve then with my water style. Exactly, Pian Dao nodded, sounding pleased. My style has been honed by taking bits from every culture I had encountered, the aggressive side of the Fire Nation, the solid defense of the Earth Kingdom, the motions of the Water Tribe, and the flexibility of the Air Nomads. See, I nodded. T will give you the base, is up to you to build something beautiful with it. Or let it die like a rose in winter, Master Piandao added, as he left the training yard. The days passed with me training and losing sores with Piandao over and over and over again. It was humiliating, but at the same time, was happy to be learning, after our talk that day. Things seemed to click better for me. It had become easier to learn. You have improved, tremendously, Piandao said, pleased with my development. You are ready. Ready? For what? For what? You have learned the bases of the sword. It's time for you to make that something of your own. That was it. A month of training? I mean, yes, I did learn, but a month. Isn't this a bit fast, I inquired with uncertainty. Learning how to swing a blade correctly takes no time, Piandao smiled, becoming a great swordsman. Now that takes decades, I know it seems fast, but if I keep teaching you, you will only copy me. The sword, the user, and the style have to be unique if you have to truly be a warrior. T suppose that's right, I chuckled. If you want, you can stay, but I know you have other things to do, Piandao said, giving me a map. What you seek is in there. I took the map with a childlike sense of excitement, and smiled. Inside there was the location I had been looking for in his library. Every time I asked you said you didn't know, and so did Fat. I eyed him with a chuckle. To wanted to finish your training first, an incomplete base is worse than no base at all, Piandao stated. Thanks for everything. Finding an earthbender master was harder than I had originally anticipated, with Boomy out of the picture things had complicated. I had to find a master that listened before striking. A master on the ways of the neutral jing. Bumi stated that the neutral jing is the key to earthbending. The art of the neutral jing apparently involves listening, though seemingly doing nothing, and waiting for the right moment to strike. And I, T did make sense, for when in combat, earthbenders are usually more stationary than other benders, waiting for their opponent to come to them, while standing their ground and meeting their opponent's attacks head-on before delivering a deadly counterattack of their own. I'm sure your master will be huge, Sokka smiled. Big muscles, big power. Muscles mean nothing in bending, Sokka, Katara sighed. Katara is right. Bending is more about the spirit and less about the body, I added. Well, I still think your master will be huge, Sokka shrugged. I was the best of the best, unmatched, undefeated, and I ran out of uns, but it doesn't matter. I'm awesome. These idiots in the arena keep trying to take my throne, but none of them will ever even manage to make me sweat. In the arena, I was a goddess, 
but at home I was, I felt worthless. The shame that tormented me was all the more corrosive for coming from the people that were supposed to see value in me, and yet saw nothing but the surface of what I was. I didn't know why I felt so tainted and worthless and wrong with them, only that I did, and that whenever I was in the arena I felt partly whole. In the arena I wasn't the poor blind girl everyone felt pity for. No, I was the blind bandit, a powerful and independent earthbender, a force to be reckoned with. Lady Beifong, is time for your bath, one of the servants said. To think I can take this one myself, I was blind, not stupid, why can't they see that? I'm afraid I can't let you do that. There are many dangers during bath time. Once again, I had been refuted immediately. I hate this. Chapter 32. Chapter 32. If you want to read ahead, go and check a/pn.com slash cornbringer. I'm currently updating twice a day on Patrixon. Love you guys. The same day, Master Piandao said I was ready to master the way of the sword on my own. I left, had now a map guiding me to where I had to be. Today like any other day in the surprisingly cozy Fire Nation, the sun shone bright in a cloudless sky, every now and then a bird would fly by, but besides that nothing much. The Fire Nation was calm and beautiful, so much at times it would make me forget about the war altogether. So far, I really couldn't complain. Besides my meeting with Vatu, things were going awesome for me. I even had the luck to find a merchant group after I left the island that offered to take me there if I escorted them all the way there. And while I was mostly inclined to outright reject the offer, I decided to do otherwise and accept it. That way, I would be seen as considerably less suspicious to the eyes of others, soldiers especially. I wanted to avoid fights, for the time being. As the caravan advanced through one nearby towns, a group of soldiers stopped us. Nothing serious, just routine checks. I knew that much. With a long, scrutinizing look, I studied the orderly row of the soldiers in front of my ride, with their helmets gleaming in the sunlight. There were about two dozen men, on foot, in the rear guard, all in identical red and black armors, some carrying long spears and swords. One of them had a slightly different armor, and if I had to take a guess, he was their squad captain, or something similar. Not only that, but he was the one doing all the talking, showing he had in a way authority. I was ready to literally rain hell on them, but I had to wait if they didn't stop us. It would save me a lot of trouble, if possible. A low profile was best for me. Everything seems good, the captain stated, eyeing the paperwork the merchant had given him. Be on your way. I inwardly cheered the fact that I didn't have to kill them all, which while easy, it would have made the trip a living hell. Ozai, for one, would want my ass on a silver platter. Without any more interruptions, the caravan continued with the trip, eventually taking us in the depths of a forest, plagued with thieves. That, or really human-like monkeys methodically following us. All new thanks to my water sense was that we were being followed. I had two options in how to deal with this situation. One, using my bending to take them all, saving the caravan, and revealing my identity. Two, using only what Piandao had taught me, keeping my low profile. I suppose I'm about to see how much improvement with the sword I had obtained after that crash course Master Piandao gave me. And here we go. Three, two, one. As if on cue, a man with a very Assassin's Creed look leaped from one of the trees, his arms and legs spreading wide to keep the balance in the air. The man in question landed with ease on one of the mounted men beside one of the many carriages in a deadly crouch. His weight, combined with the gravitational force of the landing, immediately brought both man and horse to the ground in a painful mixture of a neigh, a cry, and a loud crash, blood splattering everywhere. The poor man the thief had landed on was now dead in a pool of blood on the ground while his horse was running away in fear. The man stood up, unsheathing his blade and pointing at us with it, and said, Surrender all your belongings, and we will let you live. Crowley eyed me and the man, and simply skipped away to an empty hay bed, like saying, you get in way too much trouble, I'm going to sleep. I rolled my eyes at Crawley, as I kept on observing the situation, wondering what the merchant would pick, his merchandise or his life. We won't give you anything. Freeloaders. Oh, his merchandise it is. Very well. The man snapped his fingers. 
and more Assassin's Creed lookalikes forms jumped down from nearby trees. The assailants all Lou, Ked identical, with slight differences, like height and weight. But besides that, it was like a fucking Assassin's Creed convention out here. Kill them all, the man ordered. I sighed as I rushed in to help the caravan. If push came to shove, I would use water bending to kill them all. So this wasn't much of a tough situation for me. Taking a step forward, the man tried to cut me with his blade. I surprisingly found myself easily countering his attack and cutting his throat, getting my clothes dirty with the blood the now dead man had spilled on my clothes. Killing with a weapon sure is way messier, I muttered, as I continued to field test my new skills. Akira was starting to make this game fun, like a mouse, getting into a lion's den. He was making this game so interesting that for a moment, a brief moment at that, I wanted to stop chasing Zuzu and the Avatar, just to kill him. I had no idea what his motives were at this point, nor I actually cared, but he was playing a game. I was known to always win, I always catch my prey. But the question now was, where was him? I had unfortunately lost track of him after the fire colony in the Earth Kingdom, who I had to personally punish for being so stupid. After that, I knew he was heading towards the Fire Nation, and considering he is probably trying to keep a low profile, three places came to mind, Xujing, the Fire Nation Bazaar, or the pitiful town Zhanghui, and two of those options were practically out of the window. The Fire Nation Bazaar had too much security, one mistake, and he would have the entire nation on him, and the disgusting town of Zhanghui had nothing to offer him in the military point of view. Which only left Xu Jing from there, his options were nearly limitless. The island was vast and with little to no security, meaning he would have time to plan his next move uninterrupted. From Xu Jing, it pained me to admit I had no idea where he would go from that point, but like everything else, I would eventually figure out. After all, I have to keep tabs of all my prey, the Avatar, Zuzu, my uncle, and of course, him. Chapter 33 Chapter 33 If you want to read ahead, go and check he.patreon.com slash cornbringer. Love you guys. The massacre continued, with us losing in a humiliating manner, but I was not going to let that trouble me. So turning to my next target, I ran towards my prey with my sword ready. The assassin barely had time to react as my sword hit him in the chest, leaving a nasty cut on it, followed by a horizontal cut cutting his throat, killing him. At the same time, one of the assailants had tried to land a strike on my seemingly wide-open back. But thanks to my water sense, I felt the bastard approach and leapt high backward in retreat, dodging the attack in a flowing motion like a wave on the sea. The assassin who had just tried to attack me was now engaged fighting another bodyguard, ripping him apart. A battle cry echoed in the vicinity as the heavily injured near-death firebender bodyguard tried to burn his attacker off him with a straight punch, followed by a small torrent of fire. As the assassin dodged and the firebender died from his injuries, I dashed forward to intercept him. This was the perfect opening. The guy had ignored me and this was my chance to kill him for it. Fast like a cat, I sneaked behind, piercing his throat with my blade. Out of the 80 people that the caravan I was guarding had, only two remained, me and another guard who was bleeding out so technically just me, and only 15 of the Assassin's Creed lookalikes had died, and they were easily over a hundred around. It all hinted that I would have to use water bending soon. Too bad for the people that hired me though, but oh well. It's it worth it to die for. This? One of the assassins pointed to the caravan. That is a very, boy, very nice question, I chuckled bitterly, as used water bending to lower the temperature around, little by little. Tell me, is it worth it? You think you will win? One of the assassins chuckled, Tam pretty confident in my skill to kill you all. Then again, you are welcome to try and prove wrong, I chuckled in amusement, as I focused on the water around their feet. Kill them the leader of the assassins ordered. But, none of them moved an inch. Though they tried, they found themselves in a sticky situation, for their feet were trapped in ice. Thanks for the conversation. It gave me more than enough time to freeze all of you. I winked at them, appreciating their looks of terror and their futile struggles to escape their imminent death. As above each and every single one of them, shape and deadly ice spears started to form. 
It was a very educational way to learn how to use my sword in a real-life situation. It was good, but I rather stick to bending for the time being, and with the snap of my fingers, the forest was drowned in screams and blood. To wonder, was it really worth it to die for, a bunch of silk? I wondered out loud. Caw, you are right, it wasn't, I chuckled. Taking one of the lizard horses the caravan had, I decided to continue with my journey, not before melting and evaporating all the water I had used, to avoid being discovered. Early morning, the sun hung high in the sky, and I felt a little bit guilty. I had allowed once again my empath shit to take control. I had effectively enjoyed killing the assassins, but nothing would bring me down. Not today. Today I was particularly happy, for I was very close to my destination. All it took to know that was a quick glimpse around, trees and other vegetation around had faces carved into them. It was both beautiful and creepy. Further away, I could see expansive fields of corn in almost all directions, with a few thatched cottages scattered here and there. Every now and then, farmers would cross my path, and walking towards the village I was looking for, the village of Hira, I would ask every single one of them, they would confirm that. Fuck yeah! Excuse me, sir? I stopped a farmer once again, that was passing by. Is the village of Hira in that direction? I inquired. Yes, it is. The farmer smiled. Not many know about us, but we are always happy to have tourists, he added. Perfect, I smiled. Master Jatso always said a journey is not a journey without its downs, and I never expected that to happen while flying over a swamp. I had been separated from my friends by a wild tornado, had to find them. If it wasn't for me, they wouldn't even be here. Katara, I called. Appa, Momo. Nothing. The only thing I would hear in return were the echoes of my cry, Sokka. I continued to run through the forest, calling their names over and over and over. They had to be somewhere around here. And if they were okay, they would probably also be looking for me and the others. So all I could do was keep trying. Next time, I would follow my instincts. I was a fool to not do so. I felt the swamp was calling me. I told them to land. But their reluctance... Convince me otherwise, and now we are here, but separated. Ha <sighs> ha! A girl laughing? I turned around to see a small girl laughing at me. She was wearing a white and green kimono. As for her face, the girl turned around before I could see it, and ran chasing a flying boar that had appeared out of nowhere. Wait! I called out, chasing after her. I felt strange in this swamp, lost and yet found, alone yet in company. It was a confusing situation for me. That voice, Mom, Gran Gran used to say, grief was like the ocean, it came in waves ebbing and flowing, sometimes the water was calm, and sometimes it was overwhelming, all we could with it was learn how to swim. I never did, every day, the painful memory of the day they took my mother from me, drowned in a sea of anger and pain. Katara, Mom, I cried out, following her voice, I knew this didn't make any sense, I knew she was dead, but it didn't matter. Just the sound of her voice would be enough for me, just to remind me a little bit of her. Chapter 34. Chapter 34. If you want to read ahead, go and check Clara Bredad Bogdana Kaz Left Cornbringer. Love you guys. And you are? I asked with clear skepticism about everything that was transpiring. See? After I arrived at the village, a random wolf appeared in the room I rented. Normally this would be no problem for me, but the wolf was not alive. He had no water at all on his body. Even though he drank some of my toilet, the point is, I knew this wolf was a spirit. Ergo, why I was asking said wolf who he was. Studying the creature closely, I noticed that it reminded me of Vatu in a way. The wolf had markings on his body that glowed every now and then, giving the wolf a sense of mysticism that was vexing. Tam, one of the spirits who resides in this forest. But I'm not important. My master's signature in every plant, animal, and human, from the smallest possible babe to the mightiest of beasts. Many have different names for her, but only one is true, for she's the mother of all faces. I have to be honest as the wolf spoke. I was kind of surprised he did. One was speaking a wolf or some shit. So, your master is the mother of faces, right? I inquired, getting a nod for an answer from the spirit wolf. Can I meet her? Yes, you are a vexing for her for you are the one creature whose face she didn't mold, the wolf stated. Wait, my face wasn't molded by her. Red flag. No, 
Crimson flag. Cool, cool, cool. Unrelated question. Is she mad about that? I'm not entirely sure, but I do not think she is mad. Mostly interested. The wolf answered, and yes, I'm not meeting the almighty face giver now. Who knows what would happen? All right, I'm Ow. Before I could even manage to finish my sentence, the wolf howled, and in the blink of an eye I was standing in front of a lake. Fuck, I cursed. To have brought the human, my lady. I will kill that wolf if she tries to kill me. I'm not going down alone. Intriguing. A soothing yet commanding voice muttered, taking a deep breath. I studied the massive big spirit in front of me. Her appearance was, not that impressive really, like a big tree with many faces, but her presence was overwhelming. I knew just by looking at her, that she could crush me even with my bending on an instant. A face I did not give. A soul I have not touched. Nor any other primordial spirit. Life hasn't touched you. Death hasn't touched you. It's vexing, and yet so unnatural. Would like to clarify. One don't have anything to do with any of this. One mean what you just said. I clarified. I did not want to die because I was an anomaly. I know, that much I know, the mother of faces replied, but this is something we have to rectify. Your mere existence breaks the balance of things. What? Look, I'm not breaking anything. This bitch is going to kill me. Well, you are going down with me, Scooby-Doo. Your fear is unnecessary and misplaced. I won't kill you for it's not your time, nor is it within my realm to do so. I will merely give you what you never had the chance to get, a face just for you. Wait, she wants to Michael Jackson my ass? It will in a way give you what you want, for you must also meet the primordial spirits to get the things that were negated to you by whoever created you. T don't want a new face though, I stated. One mean, fuck it, it's not even my original face anyway. But I suppose I don't have much of an option. That is correct. I can't allow a face that hasn't been molded by me. Rome free is an insult to my purpose. The mother of faces nodded. What exactly have I been negated? I asked with curiosity. A face to call your own. A life to call your own. An ending to call your own. Even your bending is but a pale imitation of what it could be. For the blessing within you is incomplete. Tui and La tried to fix you, but they failed for it's not their realm to do so. In short, you are a pale copy, a weak imitation of what a human being should be, a cruel joke of an unknown being. Wait, was the great value version of a human in this world? What in the actual fuck? I was stronger than anyone I had met, except maybe for Iroh, how could I be? Just but an imitation. You will be complete. Once you get the gifts every living creature is entitled to, starting with a face. Very well. As long as I keep my memories, and I keep being handsome, God knows I will cry if my face ends up being something ugly. It took me a while, but I found my friends, but even then, the illusion of that girl laughing still haunted me. Who was she, and why was she so important? I felt like I had to know, like she was the key to something, an important part of my mission. I was so lost, and I was supposed to be the Avatar. I was supposed to know these things. Maybe I would know later. Maybe I wasn't supposed to know until the time came. I really hate my job. It's so confusing at times. Anyone else would have been better for it. Appa is near. My boomerang can feel him. Sokka stated with a wide grin. For the last time, that's not how boomerangs work. Katara growled in annoyance. Let me have a dream. Sokka cried out, pouting. We will find Appa and Momo. No matter what, I added, breaking their sibling bickering. We will. Katara nodded. Of course we will. We are unstoppable. Chapter 35. Chapter 35. If you want to read ahead or read other novels on the work, go and check catch that Patreon. That's Cornbringer. Love you guys. Arise, Akira. I felt a tingling sensation on my face. My new face. It felt like, on the lake my reflection was clear I looked like Sinbad from Magi, but with blue hair instead of purple. Weird, but at least I was still handsome. So, this is my face. I asked touching my face, marveling at the little details, like how my skin was a tone lighter than before, or how my hair was longer to the point of almost touching the floor, which would need to be fixed soon. It was shocking, and while my face did remind me of Sinbad, I could actually see aspects of my original face on my new one. My nose, my ears, and even my lips were almost identical to the ones I had before coming to this world. 
giving me sense of familiarity I didn't have with the face I had been originally given when I got here. Yes, a face has been given, and now a name must be retrieved, the mother of faces replied. I took a moment to absorb that information, a name must be retrieved? Did that mean I had to get a new name? I, do I have to get a new name? How you call yourself is irrelevant, but every soul has a name, unique. You must meet he who has named everything and everyone, the mother of faces said as the lake shone bright. A nameless soul is a broken soul. Aname gives the soul power, purpose. For a soul without a name is nothing but a battery that keeps your body running. A insult to the principles of life and death. I had an amalous soul. Just who the fuck send me here? And why did they do such a sloppy work for the love of... Very well, lead the way, I sighed. I'm afraid I will not guide you, for this journey is your alone. The mother of faces said, as she snapped her fingers creating a portal in her lake. I will, however, give you a piece of advice. Not all the primordials will help you so willingly. Some will take offense of your existence. Especially kindred, they won't like this situation at all, she added in a low tone, as she pointed to the portal. Now go, and claim what is rightfully yours, kindred. Who the fudge is kindred? Okay, I'll have that in mind. I nodded as I walked towards the portal, wondering deep down what terrors and wonders awaited for me in the spirit world. I wish you the best. Anomaly. And that was the last thing I heard before the portal swallowed me whole. Anomaly. Well, that's not the worst title possible, I think. The next thing I knew, I was standing in the spirit realm. The trees and animals were both similar and vastly different to the ones in the physical world. It felt different being here in body and spirit than just being in spirit. So, you found a way to come, perfect, that voice, Cheshire Cat. Is this your forest, I asked, as I studied the area, it seemed different. No, I felt you come here, and well, came to welcome you. The cat purred a laugh out. That seems like something you would do, I chuckled. By the way, digging the new face. The cat smiled exploding in a mix of smoke and confetti, reforming on my shoulders. She never gives second faces, unless she feels bad for the person. So you either have a terrible past, or she never gave you a face. Intriguing, he purred the last word out. Something like that, I chuckled. Zuko was near to the point of leaving me behind. I knew that. I knew that at one point he would embark on his own journey of self-discovery, and the truth was that unless he let go of his pain, unless he forgave himself, unless he forgave the situation he was in, unless he realized that the situation was over and out of his control, he would not move forward, had to let Zuko go, if I wanted him to grow, no matter how much it pained me, to do so. I had to let my dear nephew, my dear soldier boy, depart on his journey alone, for only then he would see he a facet of himself he had yet to discover. I don't know when it would happen, but I knew it would happen soon. Another day, another victory for the blind bandit. 1 a.m., undoubtedly awesome. There isn't a gladiator alive capable of matching my muscles. It was truly shocking the contrast of how things went for me on the arena and on my house. My lady, dinner is served, one of the servants in the house said. Allow me to escort you to the table. T know my way there. I hated how everyone treated me. I was blind, not brainless. To can't let you walk by yourself there, my lady, the servant stated. God, how I want to smash these idiots to the wall like flies. Very well, you may lead the way I bit the words out, extending my hand, like Uger lady was supposed to do it. As the idiot walked me to the dining table, I felt my mother and father talking about me. I didn't quite get about what, but I felt thanks to the vibrations I had caught with my seismic sense on the earth, it was about me. Top sweetie, how was your day? Mother greeted me with a smile. She was happy. Today has been delightful, mother. God, I hate the role I have to play to keep them happy. Great to hear. Father smiled as he signaled one of the servants to help me sit. For the love of God, I'm blind, not, ah, uh, forget it, is not like they can hear my inner rambles. Chapter 36, Chapter 36 if you want to read ahead or read other novels on the work, go and check captap patreon.com slash cornbringer. I have the flu. Any home recipes for it? I feel like Goku came and gave a sensu bean to my flu when I was about to win. Goku, why?
After my brief chat with the cat, everything went downhill. Immediately, one second I was chatting with the crazy bastard, and the next I was in a void, seemingly floating aimlessly. I blinked a few times, trying to recover from the strange sense of vertigo I'd gotten in this foreign realm, but immediately saw Stara as a result, thousands of them. While beautiful, it brought one of the most excruciating pain I'd ever experienced. Who the fuck had I offended to get such pain? All I did was get a new fucking face, free plastic surgery. Was that a sin here? Aname must be retrieved, a voice spoke in many echoes, for it to happen. A soul has to remember how to be. Escape the depths, and I will retrieve your name. I. What in the actual fuck? Fire. Tons of it, covering what seemed to be a wasteland of destruction and agony. It almost seemed I was inside a volcano, half active, half not. Wow. Never seen you here before. Who are you? A feminine voice asked with excitement, as I only now noticed someone was near me. She was, well, she looked human, except for her eyes and legs besides that. One found interesting her clothing choices, she was wearing a black thong and a bikini which barely covered her nipples. Uh, sorry my name is A. Just call me dude or something. Great I can't say my name, or the one I had for me. It's like something or someone is muting me every time I try. Okay. The unknown girl shrugged. So why were you sent here, or are you a local? What, too, I asked. This is hell, or Tartarus, where the most evil human spirits are sent the big old trash can of the world. Hell, maybe it was best when I had my fake name and face. I'm starting to think being the great value of myself is best. Who knows, I answered, realizing if this was hell, everyone here was a possible asshole. Mysterious, I like it. The unknown girl smiled seductively. I was condemned after I killed my entire family for fun. I swear to God, I will learn spirit bending, just to kill the bastard that names things. Well, not that this hasn't been interesting, but I have to go, far away from your crazy ass. But I wanted to have fun. The girl smiled, trying to catch me off my guard, as she tried to stab me, and thank God, even in here I have my bending, for I like a man of honor. Froze the bitch, creating the first of its kind a bitchicicle. Wait, how is water bending working, if everything around me is, well, fire and lava? The water here should be minimal or non-existent. Deciding to ignore logic for a moment, I looked around, seeing the place seemed to be inside a volcano, with stairs leading to the exit. Taking a deep breath, I started to walk towards the top, freezing and maiming every sinner I encountered on my path. And I'll be honest, had no idea what mission or anything I had to do here. It was annoying but easy, so why send me here, to a place I don't even belong to? Ha! Ah, how wrong I was to say it was easy. I mean... Yes, it was. But boy, things can be hard in more than one way. Hours turned into days, and days into months. And I kept on climbing the stairs that seemed to extend infinitely. The worst part was that I knew I hadn't been here for months, but it felt like it. Kinda felt Itachi was my personal jailer. All right, the stairs are not an option, so what else can I do? A hum taking a seat on the ground. D. A poor idiot had once again tried to kill me and like all the others was now frozen, it kind of felt this place was full of hanks. Hence, the idiot who was supposed to be engaged with you, oh god, this is not any hell. This is my personal hell, but in all seriousness, I was tired, no matter what I tried or how hard I tried, the goal seemed to be, always at the same distance. T give up. I sighed, throwing my hands to the air in defeat. I can't escape this alone. This is a prison, a challenge I can't beat, I chuckled as I closed my eyes, trying to take a moment to think to organize my ideas. After a few minutes of not moving with my eyes closed, I decided to continue on my impossible journey, just to find. I wasn't in the place anymore. What? I muttered. You have passed. A voice echoed in my head. Who are you? I asked. I am the truth. One a.m. who names every soul and knows their truth, their sins and blessings. The voice said as he appeared in front of me, shocking me. The truth as he called himself was nothing but a featureless version of me, like someone had just drawn the edges of my body, without coloring or doing anything else. He had no face, nothing. I don't have a face because I am older than the mother of faces. Named her after all. As if reading my mind, the spirit answered. I don't have a form. 
Right now, all you see is a reflection of your broken soul. Why did you send me to hell? I asked, trying to avoid sounding angry. My test was the test almost every human fails, humility. You had to accept you are incapable of doing everything, and that as a human, you are mortal, and things will not always go your way. The truth stated, hell was a prison, a test you created for yourself. All I did was push you into it. For hell doesn't exist here physically, but in your mind, are you saying, my own mind, fudge me over? I wanted to say fucked me over. Oh, I wanted to curse like a sailor, but would have to wait until the Almighty Spirit was done with me. Humans tend to be their own worst enemy. The mind is not always our friend. The truth said. Months trapped in my mind, I almost growled in disbelief. Like a dream that feels like a lifetime. You did not spend the time you experienced. You were out for maybe an hour or so. The truth added amused with my reaction. Now, it's time to fix your soul by giving you your name. I had tsukiyomi my ass. Hate myself so much right now. Chapter 37 Chapter 37 If you want to read ahead or read other novels on the work, go and check akepatreon.com slash cornbringer. My flu is getting better, aka disappearing. Love ya. Your name is... The truth said, and one thought clouded my mind. What the fuck does that mean? Don't understand that, I smiled awkwardly at the mighty spirit. You don't have to understand it. A soul's name is sometimes only known to me. The truth stated. Now, it's time for you to go. Gaia, the mother of life, is growing impatient. Well, they are growing impatient. Good luck with their test. For life is not always easy. Fuck. I muttered as I once again lost consciousness. Go to the other side of the forest if you want to pass. That's all it takes. As my body slowly woke up, I immediately noticed something wrong. Very wrong. Super wrong. Though I still didn't know what exactly was out of place. Taking a deep breath, I rolled around trying to move my arm. Finding what was wrong, my arm didn't listen to me. It felt weird. Come on. Just move. I encouraged my arm. It still wouldn't move. I groaned as I opened my eyes to see what was keeping my arm from moving. What I saw surprised me greatly. Taking another deep breath, I whipped my head around left and right, trying to find out where I was and what was wrong. It was when my head continued past the point it was supposed for the fourth time that I noticed. Huh. Since when I have owl powers. Deciding to test that again, I carefully turned my head as far as it would go in both directions. And yes, I had an owl neck apparently, going all the way back to my OMG. Breath Akira. Breath. Let's check the facts. 1. I have a weird neck, and my back, my back was made out of water. Well, to be precise, feathers made out of water. Great. Haha. -ha. What's next? A beak. God, please no. Crossing my eyes to check that taunt to the Murphy Law I had just invoked, I discovered I did in fact have a peak, a pitch black hawk beak, on my face. What type of fucking test was this shit? Who the fucks make someone a bird to learn about life? God, these spirits make no sense. My water wings ruffled in annoyance. As I skipped through the forest, maybe this was a quest to appreciate my human body. As I walked, I felt something spying me through the bushes. I narrowed my eyes at the spot. Suddenly two dots appeared in front of me, just floating there, menacingly. A, eh, the fuck is that? Is a predator, isn't it? As if answering my question, teeth filled my vision as the creature leapt from the bushes. Shit! I shouted in surprise, avoiding the attack with ease. In front of me stood what could only be described as a shadow wolf wearing a mask. Literally, that a fucking wolf made out of shadows. I kind of feel like a Pokemon now. The wolf lunged once more and I dodged once again. The wolf seemed to take pleasure in the fact I was fighting back. Trying to end this charade, I tried to attack him with water bending. And surprise, I had no water bending, no bending, no human body to fight, and a massive size difference. Awesome. Gotta love Gaia. Well, if I can't fight it, I can certainly avoid death, perhaps. Now that I knew I was vulnerable, all I could focus was on the needle-sharp, saliva-dripping maw that wanted to consume to consume me. I continued to avoid the big shadow wolf for a while, but in the end, the shadow wolf proved to be the superior predator and sank his sharp teeth into my body, killing me. It's weird to feel how life fades away. It's impossible to describe the pain and relief that one feels during this. 
but instead of actually dying, I woke up once again, where I had woken up as a big water hawk. Didn't I just die? Yes, yes I did. How can I be? Focus. This is another mind trick. There has to be a way out. With that in mind, I decided to try another approach. Maybe flying would do the trick. I was a bird now. And for the duration of this test, I had to think like one. Birds don't walk through infested predator forests. No, they fly. Easier said than done. While getting off the ground was easy, controlling my wings was harder. Two hours later, and 100 cranial contusions, I was ready to fly, and I couldn't help but smirk when I passed the spot the wolf was supposed to be. Inwardly praising myself for the genius idea. I am a... Pain struck me like a lightning. And all of the sudden, I was falling down like a dead goose, a glowing arrow protruding from my watery chest. Someone had shot me. Fuck me sideways. Once again, I woke up in the same fucking spot. So flying and walking doesn't work. Maybe swimming? If I recall correctly, there isn't anything big enough in a forest river to eat a hawk. And just my luck, as I was flying before the arrow struck me down, I had noticed a river nearby. Walking to the river was easy. And swimming was also easy. Perks of having my wings and body being out of water. Now, all I have to do is get to the other side and end this Lovecraftian nightmare. Run and die. A deep voice accompanied by a growl shouted, the wolf. Fuck. The endless cycle of me trying to avoid the mysterious marksman and the wolf repeated itself hundreds of times. Everything I tried would be countered by those two one way or another. In the end, the result was the same. Me dying, over and over again. Tam done. I chuckled bitterly. Fuck the test. I don't want the gift. Is like trying to eat healthy in McDonald's. Impossible. Do you choose the teeth? A soothing voice asked stalking me like a prey from behind a tree. I didn't even notice the weird entity getting there. Or the arrow. A voice deep and hungry whispered in my ear. It was the wolf, standing behind me. Does that even matter, I laughed. Isn't the result going to be the same, me dying? You are right. In the end, it doesn't matter. The end result is the same, for death is unavoidable. The calm and soothing voice said from behind the tree. You have learned the truth of death. You have passed. The wolf growled, annoyed. Fret not, dear wolf. We will hunt him when his time comes. The other entity stated, A wolf, arrows, death? You are kindred, I stated. Yes, we are. The wolf growled his answer. Never one. Without the other. The still physically unknown entity completed the sentence. That's right, dear lamb. That's right. The wolf laughed. So, can I go now? I asked them. You pass the test of life and death. Gaia decided to leave us to test you, for we are two sides of the same coin. Now, you must meet he who created the spiritual power, and your body will be complete, both wolf and lamb said at the same time. As I nodded, just wanting to escape the hell I had been forced to live, to learn a lesson I didn't even need. Okay, maybe I did, but not like this. Not like this. We give you the blessings of life and death. Until next time. Chapter 38 if you want to read ahead or read other novels on the work, go and check .patreon.com, patreon.com, cornbringer. Love ya. After my test with the spirit of death kindred, I was once again kicked out whatever realm they had. Slowly opening my eyes, the first thing I noticed was that I was in a house of sorts, then the hard and slightly cold floor underneath me, then the smell of tea. It took me a few seconds to realize I was lying on the floor in a stereotypical Japanese household, Odd but not the oddest, thought it was something I had not been expecting at all. Realizing this was probably my last test, I bolted up in surprise. After the painfully terrifying test of the spirit of death, I, well, wasn't exactly thrilled to be here. Slowly walking out of the house, I was immediately greeted by the sound of birds happily tweeting in the air. Animals of all kinds played and jumped in the green fields around me, and I could not help but stare in delight at how lovely it all looked and thought I could spend hours just marveling at these seemingly stupid things. If the test was to admire how lovely things were, well, the last spirit was lucky, after the last two. Truth and kindred, well, anything looks like a day in the beach, and this looks like fucking heaven. Mentally, it had been so long since I had actually relaxed that I had forgotten how it felt. Beautiful, isn't it? 
a bunny asked as he hopped towards me. I thought you deserved this, after kindred and truth. Gaia knows I have no idea how you keep yourself together. I eyed the bunny, the small and cute bunny, and asked, You are a bunny? Oh, no ha ha, the bunny laughed. This is just a glamour, an illusion of sorts, so that I can talk with you. See, 1am the biggest spirit in the world. The lion turtles were my pets at one point. So, yeah, wait, those massive things were his pets. Shit, holy crap, I chuckled. Well, thanks for the break. I have been tortured mentally and physically to get something that was supposed to be mine without any of this. What was the fucking point? Yes, they can be a pain sometimes. I apologize for their behavior. The bunny sighed sadly. Well, you are free to go. What about my gift? I asked the bunny. I gave it to you before you even came here, right before kindred kick you out of their realm. The bunny shrugged. I eyed the bugs bunny lookalike. No test? Nope, I'm free to go? I asked. Yep, no hidden tests. I asked once again. Nope, you have officially become my favorite spirit. I laughed. Haha, thanks. Now go. The bunny pushed me, with ease might I add, to a portal that opened in the middle of the field. You have a very worried cat out there, trying to enter the primordial spirit realm. Ah. Cheshire cares. Thanks, no problem, pal. The bunny smiled, kicking out of his realm. Through the portal I landed on Cheshire, in cartoony way. Erg. Finally, the cat turned to smoke materializing in front of me, with a worried look. For a moment there thought they wanted to kill you. I tried to get in and save you, but I couldn't enter their realms. Yeah, I was told. I chuckled. Did something bad happen in there? The cat asked with low hiss, not exactly directed at me. Well, I was mentally tortured, into a prison with no escape. After that, I was teleported to a forest, where for some reason I was a fucking bird. I paused, seeing my crazy cat friend confused and ready to ask a question. A bird? The cat asked after a second. Yes, a water hawk. I nodded. Why? The cat asked after another second. To have no freaking clue. I sighed. In the forest, I then proceeded to die in every imaginable way to a pair of assholes, over and over again. Just to show me, death is unavoidable. Would have loved to get that explanation on a PowerPoint presentation or a pamphlet. Heck, even an infomercial would have been nice, though the last one was very chill. He let me pass without a test, but thanks to the clear PTSD I have now, thanks to the beautiful tests, I feel this is a test or a dream, for I no longer can discern between reality and the shit they put me through. Wow, the cat said in a deflated tone, our most powerful spirits are assholes. Yes, he nodded. If you want, I can send you back to the human realm, the cat offered. No shook my head. I wanted to go somewhere else. If you can take me to Vatu. Are you crazy Vatu is? Meh. After all that you can probably deal with Vatu. The Cheshire Cat said as he opened a portal. If you need me, just shout this call. I am mad as a hatter, and I'll be there. Got it, I said stepping through the portal. A few months ago, or years, time in the spirit would be confusing. The point is a few months ago, I had the chance to escape the perfect minion to help me out of this tormenting prison. But just when I was about to offer him my power, someone woke him up, and once again, I was alone. The only thing that kept me sane was the thought of destroying Rava. Maybe that human would be back soon. Yol, that voice, the human, how naive, he was different, his body was different. What in the actual? You have changed, I stated. Oh, you chaotic bastard, you have no idea. The human laughed though I could feel his laugh was hiding pain, anger, and other emotions, hate so powerful, that it could be mistaken as my own. What changed, I inquired, as it's not every day that I find something I can't truly understand. Well, allow me to tell you a tale, and the human started. Little by little his intense hatred made absolute sense, being tortured to such a degree, and still have a sane mind, maybe I had underestimated the human. Dying at the hands and paws of kindred, hundreds of times, just to teach him a menial lesson. Spending what can only be described as decades of torture to get something that was supposed to be free for every mortal. A truly mesmerizing way to try and break someone. I would personally go for physical pain and outright annihilation, but I suppose they prefer breaking their preys apart mentally first. So that's about it. The human chuckled, 
once again radiating with such delightful hate that made me shiver. Truly, a terrible journey. I nodded with a hidden smile. Perhaps now you would want to hear my offer? To think I have an idea of what you want. The human smiled. It seems I have found a partner of my own, one with the potential to be as chaotic me. Oh dear Rava, soon I will crush you. Chapter 39, Chapter 39. If you want to read ahead or read other novels on the work, go and check ace.patreon.com slash cornbringer. Love ya. After talking a bit with Vatu, he offered a deal, his freedom in exchange for power. Isn't he adorable? Thinking I wasn't going to see behind his scheme to control my now pseudo-vulnerable mind, but I could always manipulate him. Aren't you a cutie patootie? I chuckled, trying to get a fit out of him. Cutie pa? What do you mean? Vatu growled in annoyance. You think that after all the shit I went through, I will let a spirit lease my body just because? I chuckled, and the personification of chaos at that. T can offer you power beyond your wildest dreams. Vatu growled once again annoyed. No doubt as long as I kill Rava and turn the world into a mess. I laughed. Rava has to die. Vatu spat in a somewhat angry and deflated tone. Look, let's make a deal, I sighed. Making Vatu perk up, I will consider the deal if... Vatu inquired. If we make this avatar merging thingy my way, I added with a wink, I don't trust your chaotic ass, and for a good reason, I'm pretty sure you want to manipulate me, and frankly that won't happen, but if we do this my way, I will consider it. What exactly entitles your way? Vatu asked me after a long moment of silence. Well, for starters, let's have one of those massive lion turtles merge us, or at the very least, let me consult with one of them, I answered. Only the turtle would know for sure how bad of an idea this was, and if things went wrong, would be able to separate us. The ancient ones, I see. Vatu started to move around his prison, thinking about my offer. Will I? We still kill Rava? We'll kick the Avatar's ass, that was already on my plans, but I am not sure about killing him. I hummed in deep thought. But we could humiliate her and her host, if that tickles your spiritual pickle, I chuckled. Tickle my, never mind, that seems acceptable, showing Rava we are superior, in every way, in every life. Vatu laughed like the typical evil overload, and while compliant I knew he wasn't going to let this down, he was going to try to manipulate me into killing Rava if we merged. All right, then any ideas how to find one of those giant lion turtles? I asked, haven't been out in almost 10,000 years, I have no idea. Vatu stated, well, I'll find out, in the meantime. Well, I was going to say stay here, but it's not like you have much of an option, I chuckled, getting a feral growl for response. Very well, I expect you to come back, Vatu growled, annoyed at my joke. Don't get your spiritual panties on twist, I'll be back, I winked, as I called for my ride, Cheshire, to open a portal. See you later. I waved at Vatu as I stepped through the portal. As soon as I walked out the portal, Cheshire eyed me and asked, and here I thought I was mad, going over to Vatu. He isn't that bad. I chuckled. He is the spirit of chaos. He is literally the incarnation of bad, Cheshire pointed out. Chaos and evil are two different things. Chaos is not necessarily evil, but it can be, I pointed out. Chaos was in essence neutral, though of course Vatu was. More evilly inclined in the chaotic scale, but I didn't think he was pure evil. After Kindred and the others, well... He wasn't that threatening anymore. Well, if you say so, the cat shrugged. Anyway, any idea where I can find a lion turtle around here? I asked, looking around the spirit forest. An ancient one? Cheshire purred. And I nodded in answer. Well, there is one in the Fire Peninsula. Can you open a portal there? I inquired. No, that's too far away from here. The cat laughed, exploding in a mix of fire and confetti, immediately reforming on my shoulder with a low purr. Vatu I could because he was close, so we'll have to walk, or in my case, float. We, oui, I chuckled. You got that right, I will not let you go alone. Gaia, knows you are a magnet for trouble here, the cat purred teasingly. Now follow me. All right, I nodded, it would do be good to have a guide. The spirit world was truly unique and beautiful, fueled with unique wildlife and experiences that almost make up for the assholes that rule it. Trees would change colors and shapes without any reason, besides just because, and animals coexisting. It was truly mesmerizing. I couldn't blame Iroh for wanting to stay here. So, 
What did you talk about with Vatu anyway? My guide purred in wonder. He wants to escape his prison and use my body to kill Rava, bringing an era of chaos to the world, I answered, without skipping a beat. Cheshire stopped cold on his tracks. And you said no right? It said maybe, I chuckled. Are you crap? Forget that stupid question, the cat sighed in frustration. Look, I'm all about being crazy. I'm mad as a hatter, but this is crossing a line. Vatu will manipulate you. IT no, I nodded, knowing that while Vatu had technically accepted, he would still try to manipulate me from within, to drown the world in chaos, but just perhaps, I would be able to outpower his resolve, which was one of the reasons I wanted to talk with the lion turtles. But I have a feeling things will turn out just fine. Very well, Cheshire sighed in defeat. Just be careful. T will, I will, I nodded. The human had changed a lot. Though I can hardly be surprised by this development, dealing with kindred alone is a pain. I still remembered when they showed me death was unavoidable. Like the human I too had to die countless times. For nothing. Why teach an immortal being what death truly means if he can't never truly die? Even if I get destroyed, I will eventually reform inside Rava, meaning I can't die, not for good at least. This change on him was to be expected, but it affected my plans a bit. Though it was barely an inconvenience, for if he had chaos in his heart, I would win, whispering his soul to do my bidding. T will see you soon. Rava? I laughed. For the first time in 950 years, I had a real chance to escape this rotten prison. Chapter 40 Chapter 40 If you want to read ahead or read other novels on the work, go and check 8fellelfpay.patreon.com slash cornbringer. Love ya. It took Cheshire two weeks to take me to the borders of the Fire Peninsula of the Spirit Realm, before he abruptly disappeared without saying anything, leaving me in an unfamiliar place with a lot of questions. As far as the eye could see, an endless plain of red fire-colored cracked earth covered the area, interspersed with black vegetation and fire like roses. The sky in this part of the Spirit Realm looked like I would expect in hell, vivid red almost magma-colored, with the occasional black or red lightning flashing across the hellish sky. Well, I guess I have to finish this journey on my own, I muttered, as I noticed that in the far, far distance, there was a moving mountain. Wait, moving? The turtle. Seeing this was my only clue as to where I had to go, I started making my way for the moving mountain. Measuring the distance by the eye, I knew it would take me several hours to reach the foothills of the lion turtle, maybe even a day. Hopefully, I will be able to find some place to make a shelter as I make my way there. As I walk, I started to contemplate my situation. Did I really want to merge with Vatu? It had its cons and pros. For one, I would become the Avatar with some extra perks, but was it really worth it? For one, I would be forever one with him, meaning I would have to deal with his whispers of chaos for however long I will live. Well, I suppose I will get my answer about it when I get a hang of the turtle. Perhaps things will go smoothly with me and Crazy Vatu. Right now, I'm honestly more concerned about Cheshire. He just disappeared as he was guiding. Maybe I got him into trouble or something. I could hope he was okay. Maybe he had other things to do, I hummed, as a deafening crash behind me shattered my train of thought. Twirling around to find a big crater behind me, taking my distance, I looked at the crater in anticipation, water ready to strike if needed. Moments after the crash, the very earth started to shake violently, fire spreading through the area as a roar erupted from the crater. The ground shuddered and collapsed in on itself, as a huge fire, bear jumped out of the crater. Found you! Ha! The bear shouted triumphantly, with the fire around him growing in volume. Okay? I didn't know how to answer such a display of... Well, I didn't know. Should I attack him? Should I be friendly? I didn't know. But thanks the heavens, the bear made my decision easier by trying to attack me, which resulted in him being immediately frozen. Well, that was something. Finally, a worthy opponent. The bear shouted with glee as he melted my ice in the blink of an eye. Our battle will be legendary. And I died laughing. The universe played me a dirty one with that one. Oh God, W. Do you need a few seconds before we embark in the battle of the century? The bear shouted with a somewhat worried look, and then it hit me. Why I wasn't feeling any real hostility from the bear. He wasn't a bad guy. 
he was just a battle junkie, that thought I was a good choice for a dance partner. Not that I don't like the idea of a good battle, but I have a mission to complete first, I told the bear after calming down from my fit of laughter. Then I shall help you in this mission so that we can battle. The bear offered, no, more like included himself in my journey, and by this tone I knew I had no way out besides fighting him and seeing how easy he melted my ice. That battle would take a few. Very well, I sighed, digging the enthusiasm. It do everything with a 200% of myself, or he don't do it. The bear smiled. So, what exactly did you mean earlier by, I found you? Were you looking for me? I was actually quite curious. I mean, how did he hear about me to decide looking for me? I did not know you. I just greet everyone the same way, but none has ever managed to last more than a sec against a T the wild fire of my soul. The bear answered. Yeah, a battle junkie, all right. Very well, my mission is simple. I need to talk with the lion turtle of this peninsula. Help me out and I'll fight with you. Deal? Deal. And he was gone. The moment he said deal, he just ran full speed towards the mountain. I wonder when will he notice I am not behind him. I give him two hours before he does. Three if he's a total idiot. It took my newly forcibly acquired companion five hours to notice I wasn't with him. Yeah, sad in many levels. But hey, besides his constant shouting and obvious lack of normal cognitive abilities, he was a pretty chill bear. Guiding me through the fire peninsula like a professional guide, I guess thanks to the fact he was a local, if his fiery body was anything to go by, that is. T think we should set a camp? I yawned starting to feel the weight of the day slowing me down. Very well. The bear laughed. Let us compete in a camp-setting fight. Is everything with you a challenge? I asked the bear, taking a deep breath. Very well. We will save this competition for another day. The bear chuckled awkwardly, noticing my shining annoyance at his guy-like attitude. For now, let us get to the lion turtle. I yawned as I stretched my arms, focusing on creating a dome of ice to sleep in. I will sleep inside the dome, I pointed to my newly created dome. You for, well, obvious reasons need to find another place to sleep. Very well. The bear nodded as he literally burned the ground a few yards away to a black crisp and like a dog, circled the burned ground three times before falling asleep immediately. God is like someone mixed guy, a dog, and Tai Lung, and this bear came out, I chuckled before going to sleep.